Good evening, everybody. It's Matt Bowles here, Maverick Investor Group. I want to welcome everybody to a very exciting webinar. This is an event that our foreign national clients from all over the world have been asking us to do and put together for quite some time. And it's really taken a little while to get everything in place to do this properly. Um, and I'm really pleased and excited to tell you that I believe this will be the premier event for this topic because we have for you tonight two powerhouse renowned experts on the topic of U.S. tax strategy and asset protections for foreign nationals specifically. And so we brought them together to present you the uh, best most comprehensive and cutting edge uh, information on this. So we're going to do a presentation uh, for you, which is going to be uh, almost an hour long and then have a question and answer period. So just a couple housekeeping items here to begin with. You have a control panel on your screen and that uh, has a couple things there. One is a question box. Uh, we're going to hold all the questions until the end, at which point, because we're probably going to answer a lot of them on the event tonight. And then we're going to take them all at the end. But you have your question box there. That's how you're going to ask questions. And then there's also a hand icon that you should see on your control panel. And that is for you to be able to raise your hand and interact with us. For example, let's start off with a question. Uh, how many people here tonight have been to a Maverick Investor Group event before? So a webinar, uh, maybe a buying opportunity for real estate, uh, but you've participated in at least one of our webinar type events before and you know really what we're all about and what we do. If that's you, raise your hand. Just click on that hand icon so we know how many folks are returning versus how many people uh, may be new to the Maverick community tonight. Okay, great. So we've got a lot of people that are actually new to the Maverick community tonight. And so what I want to do is I want to start off by just talking a little bit about what Maverick does and then how that segues into the content that we have for you tonight. Uh, so my name is Matt Bowles. I'm one of the founders and uh, partners of Maverick Investor Group. And we specialize in working with real estate investors. We specialize particularly in working with foreign nationals that do not live in the United States uh, and helping you to buy turnkey real estate investment properties in the best markets in the United States. So turnkey, we mean single family homes or perhaps two to four unit properties with tenants already in place. These are already fully renovated properties and they have local property management in place. So it's very easy for you to buy the property, close on a performing property, start cash flowing from day one and just have those uh, checks deposited in your bank account from abroad in the country that you live in. So that's what we help you to do. Buy in the right micro markets, make sure you're in the right area of those markets uh, and then and then give you access to premium unlisted properties so that you can buy the best real estate uh, investment properties from abroad without having to come to the United States. And in conjunction with that, um, one of the things that's really important, of course, is that you need a whole series of auxiliary services because if you're going to buy a really, really good investment property, that's only step one. Step two is being able to protect your asset and being able to keep as much of that money as possible so that the government doesn't take it away in taxes or you don't lose it through certain hidden fees or you don't subject yourself to unnecessary liability um, that, can cause, uh, that can cause a threat to your, uh, your profits, okay? So with that, what we have done is we also offer to foreign nationals access to our circle of experts, okay? Our advisors that are experts in their own field, okay? So Maverick Investor Group, we specialize in helping you find and buy the right investment property for you, okay? Then we have other people that are experts in other fields, such as asset protection, such as taxes, such as uh, the legal field and so forth, and we provide you access to those experts who can help you take care of all of your auxiliary needs relating to your property purchase. And that is what we have put together for you tonight. So it is my pleasure to introduce two of the leading experts in the United States in their respective fields, Diane Kennedy CPA 
Uh, many of you uh, may know her. Uh, she had, her book, uh, Real Estate Loopholes, was originally published in Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Advisor series. That's actually how I found Diane Kennedy. Uh, she and I have known each other for over six years now. Um, and she is a best-selling author who has, uh, since that book, published I don't know how many books. It must be eight, nine uh, uh, books, all of which are, are quite remarkable. But she is... Um, you know, without question, one of the most prominent, if not the most prominent and well-known CPA uh, in the United States, and she specializes, uh, part of her specialty is she specializes in dealing with, with foreign nationals and their tax concerns. Uh, Megan Hughes is an asset protection specialist who's, who, who, again, specializes in working with foreign nationals, people from other countries, understanding what people from different countries need, how an investor from Singapore needs something different from an investor from Canada when they're coming into the United States to buy real estate. Her, her knowledge base on this is just amazing. Um, and Diane and, and Megan are personal advisors as well to, to me personally and to Maverick Investor Group. So Diane Kennedy's company does the tax return for Maverick Investor Group. Uh, and these uh, uh, folks have taken care of our clients uh, to, to rave reviews for many, 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 many years. And they have, uh, they have just recently completed their full turnkey suite of services for the foreign nationals that come in to buy property through Maverick Investor Group and all of the different things that they need. Uh, they finally just completed that. And so we're ready uh, at long last after, after quite a bit of urging by our clients to finally put together a, a comprehensive event for you on asset protection and tax strategy for foreign nationals buying real estate in the U.S. And with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, Diane Kennedy and Megan Hughes, and they're going to go through the presentation for you. Uh, and then we're going to get to the question period uh, finally at the end of the presentation. Oh, thank you, Matt. This is Diane Kennedy. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, I know we have both foreign investors and real estate brokers on the webinar tonight, but today, just to keep it straight, we're going to talk directly to foreign investors. And before we get started, I know that Matt did a bit of an introduction about us there, but I just want to give you just a little bit more information about us. Um, it, it, Matt mentioned that this is Diane Kennedy, and I've been a CPA for a lot of years. Um, I'm about to start my 31st tax season. And in that time, I've helped clients from around the world, you know, in Asia, Africa, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, you name it. My specialty is working with real estate investors and business owners. My partner, Megan, has a lot of experience in dealing with international matters. Um, Megan, uh, I'm going to let you just do a little bit of short introduction. Could you do that? Sure. Good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Um, my background, I've been a paralegal since probably the early 80s, and this one, this particular project that we're working on is really near and dear to my heart. My parents were immigrants to Canada um, back in the 60s. I was the first person born outside of England in my family. And I, in turn, became an immigrant into the United States about 12 years ago. So helping people to understand how to navigate this system is, is close to me because it's something that I've had to learn over the years and, and my time here and creating my business here and my life here. And so all of the things that I've picked up along the way, it, it's just great. I've been dying to do this for so long because this is such a crazy place, and yet there is so much opportunity here. So I'm really happy to do this webinar tonight and to have the service package for everybody. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I think maybe we have a little bit. There we go. Now that we're seeing the slides projected, on, we're going to have a lot of information that we give you. And so I hope you get a chance to be viewing this on the, your computer as we go, because it's, we're going to deal with a lot of kind of technical issues. But first, there's one thing I just need to discuss. Um, we are going to be talking about general tax and business structure information. Um, the specific strategies may or may not work for you. And this is a warning that we give every time we do a webinar about tax and legal issues, but it's especially important now. Real estate law is complicated. It varies in the U.S. by state by state. And for foreign investors, it's even more confusing because the laws between the U.S. and other countries are different. I mean, Matt mentioned this. What's true for someone from Singapore is different than it is for someone from Canada. So before you act on any of the suggestions we're talking about tonight, please make sure you have someone experienced who understands these tax and legal issues 
for your country and for the U.S. If you just go to the inter internet and look things up, you're going to find a lot of misleading and wrong information. And so, uh, uh, typically, I want if you see something, there's two things you need to think about. One, how up to date is that information? And two, what are the credentials of the people telling you the information? Okay, with that, let's get started. Um, I call this understandable confusion. If you feel like you're confused and you, you absolutely have a firm grasp of the situation, that's because there's different laws for business structures from state to state, and the rules for tax deductions and tax rates are changing. We have something, a huge thing happening January 1, 2013. They call it the fiscal cliff, and it's changing a lot of how we take deductions and the tax rates. Now, that's just for the U.S. investors. If you're coming in from another country, it can feel even more confusing. That's because a lot of these issues are different. There's a lot of business structure choices. There's unique tax issues for foreign investors. And each state that you might invest in has its own set of rules. So if you start to feel a little confused, that's OK. Uh, on this webinar, we're going to go through the important points of investing in the, the tax and asset protection issues. And there's also some things we won't cover. That's because there just isn't enough time to cover all the issues. And we don't want you to get too confused. OK, so if you contact us, or when you contact us at LegalShelfCompany.com, there's some things we're going to ask. And we're going to start off with wanting to know about you, that you the investor. Um, we're going to want to know what country you're a citizen of. Are you going to be the only investor? If you're married, is your spouse investing with you? And have you ever been issued a U.S. Social Security number? Now, if more than one person is investing in a property, we'll need to also take into account the citizenship of each of those owners. We also want to know how many properties you're going to be buying and what you expect to buy over the next few years. And we're going to need to know where you're buying those properties. Um, there's some unique challenges for the foreign investor, and we're going to be talking more about that in this webinar. I mean, if you go in and you do this wrong, you might pay 30% extra in taxes. And, but you can avoid that by using the right business structure in the right circumstances. Megan, I want to turn this over to you right now to talk about the general entities we use. Sure. You've got an awful lot of options when it comes to choosing a business structure. And I'm going to talk in a minute about my good choices, but first I want to talk about one that I really don't recommend, and that's a corporation. Now, people really like the idea that the corporation files a tax return, so not the owners necessarily, and that ownership in a corporation doesn't always and usually won't trigger estate planning issues. And they look at that and they think, wow, okay, this has got to be the right place to go because I don't want to do all these things. But underneath it, I don't think that it is the right way to go. And, and the reason on that is going to be taxes. As soon as you put an appreciating asset into a corporation, you're actually creating a long-term tax issue for yourself. And that's because in America, corporations don't get the same beneficial tax rates on the sale of an appreciated asset that other company types do. Plus, you've still got a personal tax issue when you want to get the profit out of that company. So I think that any benefits that you get through, you know, not maybe having a state issues or whatever, I think that they can be in many cases very short term. So, and, and I agree also with having a U.S. corporation that is owned in turn by a foreign corporation. You know, there are times when that may work, but it's really going to depend on the laws of your own country and how corporate profits are dealt with when they get back. So I'm kind of really... I'm really unclean, un, unhappy, <laughs> unsure, unsomething. I've got an un about, about the idea of the corporation. I think that there are better choices out there. So let me talk for a few minutes then about those good choices. Um, in our ebook, we're talking about we've got four options that we talk about. We've got a limited liability company, also called an LLC, um, a series LLC, which is like a supersized regular LLC, a limited partnership. And then a special kind of limited partnership that we call a limited liability limited partnership, or LLLP for short. Now, I like all of these for real estate. And for you, I think the best choice is going to depend on who you are, where you live, and what your investment goals are. Now, all of these structures are legal. They're all protected business structures. They're all going to give you asset protection, and they're all going to give you personal liability protection. And so what that means is if the entity is sued, you aren't going to be held personally at fault, and your other assets won't be attacked. 
not other assets, I mean things that are not within that structure. Now the owners in an LLC are called members. So if your LLC is you and your spouse, um, you can hold your interests as 50-50, so each of you have 50% separately, or you can hold them together, you jointly own 100%. And usually we actually recommend that foreign couples do hold their interest as a single member interest for some reasons we'll talk about later. Now the operators, people that, that manage a company are actually called managers in the LLC world. And they hold the same equivalent authority that the directors and the officers would in a corporation. And you could set up an LLC to be run either by all of its members or you could set it up to be run by just the people who are named as managers. You can go either way but for both flexibility and for privacy, personally I strongly, strongly recommend the manager-managed option. Um, I also like LLCs where you've got, looking at these four choices, I'm, I'm looking first at the, the original LLC, the, the original version, and I like that one where you've got one or two properties and you're not really planning on buying a lot more. Now if you do want more, then you've got a couple of choices. You could set up a whole lot of little LLCs or you could choose something that we call a series LLC. Now this is a special type of LLC that allows you to create multiple <coughs> subsidiary LLCs underneath it. We call those cells and you can create as many cells as you want underneath a series LLC. But at the same time what you've still got is one structure which is going to pay one maintenance fee and so that actually makes it far, far more economic for you than using a whole bunch of little ones. Other benefits for the series LLC are asset protection and enhanced privacy. Now the, the really neat thing about series LLCs is that each of the cells is protected under state law from the other cells. So you could place a property into a different cell as you buy them. You're gradually growing your structure and you're growing your portfolio. Now if you get into a lawsuit or you get into a problem on one of your properties, it isn't necessarily going to spill over and impact all the other ones, even if you are the only owner of everything. And that is really different from a regular LLC. If you were looking at a regular LLC and you had six properties in it and got into a problem with one of them, all of those properties, everything that's within that same LLC is equally at risk. But with the series, again, property in cell one is insulated from cell two, three, four, and so on. Plus, they're really private. Um, in most U.S. states, we aren't required to register anything other than the parent. We don't have to tell anybody. We don't have to file any paperwork to formally register the cells. And that can make it really good for you as the owner because it makes it really difficult to find out who, owns, you know, who are the owners of an individual cell. We've got nine states in the U.S. that will actually let you form one, so you can form one in any one of nine states, but the structure itself is accepted for use in all 50. Now, I love the series LLCs for foreign investors with a lot of properties. I think that it's a really good economic way to spread out your risk and safely grow your asset portfolio. I actually recommend it. I wind up recommending it more than half of my LLC planning sessions these days. Um, and in cases where I don't recommend it, there's usually something else. There's usually an impeding factor that's going on. Um, California is a really good example. California has not enacted its own series LLC law, but it does take them in from other states, which is great. However, California also charges higher taxes for LLCs. Plus, now you've got to maintain your LLC in the state where you set it up and in California. And I look at that with, you know, I'm not seeing any offsetting benefits here. So in California, I'm thinking if I'm not, I, I just don't see the point. I don't, I think you actually wind up spending more money to set it up in California and that, that is one of the instances where I actually would prefer littler LLCs. Now before, I guess, this is my except for Canada slide, and I got to add in a disclaimer. As I said, my parents immigrated to Canada. I was born in Canada, raised in the West Coast. And I know for those of you who are out there from Canada, you know how much the economies of the U.S. and the Canada intertwine. We've got a massive demand from Canadian investors to tap into our real estate market here in the U.S., um, either for rental income or just for a second home somewhere where it's warmer or drier in the winter. But because our two economies are so connected, we've got a huge tax treaty to navigate. 
The U.S. has tax treaties with a lot of countries, but the most complicated, hands down, are the ones that the countries on either border, so Canada and Mexico. We've also got NAFTA to think about and, and a lot of other things. And we have hungry governments on both sides who are looking for tax revenue. So the number one thing I could tell you as a Canadian investing in the U.S. real estate, everything I said about LLCs and series LLCs, most of the time is going out the window for you. We've got a conflict of law that's, that's, um, that's magnified by the tax treaty. And actually using an LLC in, in most instances will kick you as a Canadian into the highest possible tax bracket. So because you're different, what can you do about it? And that's, that's where I talk about options three and four. This is where we saw before the limited partnership and the limited liability limited partnership. Of the two, I actually prefer the LLLP, the Limited Liability Limited Partnership. Now, both of them are largely the same. You create an entity. It has owners. We call them limited partners. We have the people who run it. We're called general partners. General partners have exclusive ability to run that business. So if you're just named as a limited partner, you own it, but you're not also named as a general partner, you can't touch the management. You cannot get involved. Um, but you can be both. And you can have an LP, you can actually have a limited partnership of just one. And you can actually hold the role of the general partner and the limited partner at the same time. That's where the two partners come from. That's why it's actually called a partnership. It's totally legal. Now, a limited partner is protected from liability for the debts and the obligations of the partnership itself. But in the United States, the general partner, that person who's managing it, they don't get asset protection. They don't get liability protection. And that's why I don't ever want to see you acting as a personal general partner in a limited partnership. What I typically will recommend is we'll put another company in place, we'll do something else to act as the general partner instead of you personally, and that'll keep you safe. But that means now you've got two structures. You've got your partnership here, and then you've got a corporate, the corporate general partner. Two times the cost, two times the maintenance, two times the tax return. It's, you know, it starts to become less economic depending on the properties you've got. And that's, this is where the LLLP kicks in. With the LLLP, the law actually does give liability protection to the general partners. That takes away the need to create that second entity. Now, we've got LLLP in 22 states and territories, so it's way more than the series LLC. And in the ebook that, that we have prepared to go along with this webinar, we've got a list of, of the states that have the law. Um, my only caveat with the LLLP is that unlike a series LLC, we're unhappy to see you use that in any state in the country, no matter where it is. With a limited liability, limited partnership, this is actually one of those cases where I do want to see you just hold on to the states that actually have the law. And that's mostly because that that difference in the liability protection for the general partner is not something that we want to mess with even by accident. And so in that case, I really want to see you kind of contain your risk by, by using the limited liability, limited partnership in the states where, it's, where it is actually set up and where there is law on the board. That way, that'll keep you the safest. So that's a lot of choice. I know I just hit you with a deluge of information. Um, and now you've got to take a look at, OK, you know, how you narrow it down, um, where you're going to buy your property, how many properties you're looking to buy. Those are kind of the beginning questions that I take a look at when I'm starting to, to narrow things down for you. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Diane for a second. OK. Thanks, Megan. Uh, Megan handles the asset protection business structure setup part of it. And I'm a CPA. I handle the tax part of it. So um, I'm also looking for where are you buying. It's not just Canada that has unique rules. Boy, the US has some unique war rules. Take a look at your picture. There's 50 states on there. And every state has their own unique tax issues that we have to deal with. We also have to figure out um, what structure might work because of the mix of investors we have. Um, one other thing we'd have to take a look at is what the Hague Convention says about the foreign country, because that tells us how we go about getting you the taxpayer identification numbers. I'll tell you more about that in just a little bit. 
But let's take a minute and just talk about the state that you're going to be buying in. In the U.S., each state has its own tax laws and business structures that are approved. Now, th there isn't any such thing as a federal or a national partnership. Partnerships are formed, LLCs are formed, based on a particular state's rules. So you could have an Ohio partnership or an Arizona partnership, but you can't have a national partnership. To make it even more complicated, some structures are approved in some states and not approved in others. So that's where it's important to have the individual information for your own plan. For example, if you're going to buy a lot of property in Texas, we're probably going to talk about a tax, Texas Series LLC. Now, if you're buying property across the U.S. and one of those states is California, just like Megan mentioned, we might be talking about another solution. Um, that's because the Series LLC doesn't always work well in California. Um, the most important thing to remember from this slide is that it matters where the property is, not where you form your business. You might have heard forming a Delaware company is a great thing to do. But you know, if you have a property in Georgia, you're still going to deal with Georgia law no matter where you form that company. The state matters. It also matters how many properties you're buying. I'm going to turn it over to Megan and let, let her talk just a minute about some of the strategy, the structure strategy issues. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so the more that you're buying, as we talked about a minute ago, the more you buy, the more I, I really want to consider using a series LLC. Now, if you're Canadian and you're looking to buy a lot of properties, then we might want to consider a different option, possibly a nested structure where you've got maybe a series LLC you know, that is contained inside a limited liability, limited partnership. Um, that's actually one of the ways you can do it as a Canadian. You'll get your asset protection between the parties, and you can expand and grow that series LLC wherever you need to, but having the ownership flow through the limited liability, limited partnership before it comes back into Canada will actually give you a benefit there um, and, and kind of take away some of the, the tax hurdles that we deal with otherwise. Um, so let me talk for a minute actually about a success story. This one was really cool and I wanted to share it with you. This was a fun story. We had a group of seven investors. They were all from Singapore and Malaysia and they were moving fast, you know, really taking advantage and hitting the market hard. They wanted a structure that was going to grow and flex with them. And so what we did in this case is we set up a series LLC. All seven investors were members in that top one, that parent LLC. And then out of that, they nominated two people who were going to act as the managers. And so that keeps things tight from an administrative faction. You know, we've got just two people that are writing text, two that are entering into agreements. Doesn't mean that the other five don't have any say. They've got a lot of say in how things run. But it just stops you from having seven people all try to do the same thing at once. Now, because the first three properties, if you look down, you see cells one, two, and three down below a little bit. Because the first, those properties were owned by the seven people as well, what we did was we created three cells and we put a property into each one of them. And each of those cells we actually had owned by the parent LLC. Now that kept things really simple for taxes, it allowed us to consolidate it all onto one return. Now a couple of months later, you'll see deal number four came along. But in this case, only three out of the original seven wanted to buy into it. So what we did here was we created a separate cell that had separate ownership. And because the ownership was different, we had to give separate or cell number four the separate tax identity. But you see how it's still slotted under the parent LLC. We're not having a whole bunch of extra maintenance costs. You know, and, and this is one of the cool things that we're allowed to do with series LLCs. This is part of why I love them so much. Then. Deal number five came along. This was even crazier. On this deal, only one person of that original group of seven wanted that deal. Nobody else did. So the owner in that one asked if she could bring in a couple of other people with some other money. The other members had no problem with that. They didn't want anything to do with it, but they didn't want her to lose out. And so what we did there is we set up again. We set up cell number five with completely separate ownership, just like we did with four. Gave it its own tax identity. And even though we have different owners in cell five, you know, that are new people, brand new into the LLC, the way that the law is written and the way that the documents are drawn up, cell number five people cannot impact one through four. They've got nothing to do with anything or for the parent. Everything for them is nicely contained in their cells. And I love this example because it just shows how you can adopt this series LLC 
and spread it out and grow and grow all the time while keeping your costs down. I just love this structure wherever we can use it. Wow, that's great, Megan. Now, I'm going to just step it back a minute and talk about some of the little more fundamental. Megan just do all the cool stuff. I'm going to talk about taxes now. And, you know, so far the things Megan's talked about are pretty much true for U.S. investors. I mean, the series uh, LLC demonstration you just showed could work for the U.S. as well. But there are specific foreign investor challenges when it comes to taxes. You actually have three choices. You can do nothing. You can just invest in your own name, don't set up a structure, don't do anything else, and don't ever even come into the U.S. tax system. Don't file a tax return. But what's going to happen is you're going to have to pay a 30% tax with no deductions allowed. So just break that down. Let's say you rent your property for $1,000 per month. You're going to pay $300 per month in taxes. It's by far the simplest solution, but it's also very expensive. Uh, solution number two. You wait until the end of the calendar year and you file your first U.S. tax return. Because you're a foreign investor, you're going to file what's called a Form 1040-NR. But now you can't file it until you have a taxpayer identification number. I'm assuming you don't have a Social Security number from prior experience with the U.S. Um, now the IRS has a procedure for you to apply and receive an I-10, that individual taxpayer identification number, I-10, and they have this procedure when you file your first tax return. Now the problem is you have to wait, according to their procedure, until you file your first tax return. Until then, you're paying that 30% in taxes. There is no way to fast track this if you keep the property in just your name. Bottom line, you're going to pay more taxes. Now, it's going to be up to the property manager to collect and remit that 30%. So if you're thinking, well, I can get around this, well, the property manager is going to be held liable for it. Because if they miss it, that when the IRS comes knocking looking for the money, they have the authority to require the property manager to pay them first before you. And if that doesn't happen, they can seize your property. So you can't get out of it. You will pay tax, either with a tax return, or you'll pay a whole lot more tax without a tax return. By the way, before we can go any further, I want to give you just a 30-second soundbite on taxes on real estate in the U.S. You are allowed, provided you come into the system, you are allowed to take a deduction for all costs associated with the property, your property management fees, utilities, interest you might pay on a mortgage, property tax, insurance, plus your expenses associated with the property. That might mean long-distance phone calls. That might mean visits to the U.S. It all can be written off against that income. Plus, there's one more thing that's deductible, depreciation. That's the huge tax incentive that real estate investors get. They can write off a portion of the purchase price every year. In reality, most real estate investors pay little or no tax on the cash flow they receive from property in the U.S. But you only get that same benefit if you have an ITIN and file a tax return immediately. Now, if you have a Social Security number already, then you can avoid the 30% withholding issue as well. Your, the second thing is your business is also going to need to get, your business structure is going to need to get an EIN. That's an employer identification number. And more on that in a minute. Now, there's one more term you need to, to know before we move off this slide. It's ECI. The ECI is a special filing that you make to inform the IRS that the income from your property is effectively connected income. Don't worry about the fancy term. Don't worry how to do that. We'll help you with that filing. And by doing that and with your business structure, what that means is you, you avoid that 30% right away. You come into the system just like a U.S. taxpayer would with all the benefits. And in fact, a little later, I'm going to tell you how you even get a benefit U.S. investors don't get. So if you file it right and you do it right, there's a lot of benefit. Now, because I'm a CPA who focuses on taxes, there's a date on this slide that's really important to my life. You might see it, April 15th. That's when tax returns are normally due. But as a foreign investor, you actually have until June 15th to file. You can ask for an extension that will extend the time you have to file until October 15th. That's for your personal return. Now, this is just one more case where you need to be careful about what you might read on the Internet. There are differences if you're a foreign investor filing U.S. tax returns. Okay, if your head is spinning a little from all the things we've been talking about, just hang on. At the end of the webinar, I'm going to tell you how you can get that ebook Megan's been talking about for free. And yes, I said free. Okay, let's talk about the numbers. Now, there's three 
terms you're going to hear as it relates to your real estate investments in the U.S. tax system. SSN, I mentioned that before, Social Security number. You may have a Social Security number if you've ever lived, worked, or went to school in the U.S. Otherwise, uh, face it, it's going to be pretty hard to get these in today's world. Generally speaking, investors who don't already have Social Security numbers just don't even try getting one. The substitute is the ITIN. I've already talked about that ITIN several times already in the webinar. It's used by investors in place of the Social Security number. Now, the thing to remember here is that the IRS has been modifying the process to get the ITIN. And I'll tell you that they have modified it again within the last month. So the procedure I'm telling you right now today may be different in a month or two. So it's important to work with an expert who knows the ins and outs of the current process. And uh, by the way, as Megan mentioned, there's different systems on how you get that ITIN based on the country in which you live. For example, in Singapore, because Singapore is not part of the Hague Convention, it can sometimes feel like a little bit of a labyrinth to figure out how you get the documentation in for the ITIN. But there, we've got lots of experience on this, and we can help you with that. The third number on this is your business's EIN. I mentioned that again before. EIN is the employer identification number. Now, even if your real estate investment company never has employees, it's still the number you need to have to file your tax return. It's the number you're going to need to get your own ITIN in a timely manner so you avoid that 30%. And it's the number you're going to need to open a bank account. So we've been talking about the pieces that go together into putting it together that tax and business structure strategy. Megan, maybe you can tell us another real life story to kind of pull this together a bit. Sure. This was another example. This one is not as ambitious as our, our seven investor multi-cell series LLC. In this case, what we had was we had a couple who live in Australia who wanted to use their superannuation fund to buy U.S. real estate. They didn't want to buy a whole lot. They really were just looking for a duplex in Atlanta, Georgia. And so they contacted us, told us their story, and asked for our suggestions. What would we think? Now, in this case, because they were just looking at buying this duplex and they didn't really plan to go any further. We felt that a regular Georgia LLC would be appropriate. And how we set it up, we set the LLC up to be owned by the trustee of the superannuation fund. And that would be the same that we would do that in the U.S. If we had an American trust involved, we'd do the same thing. We also made our clients the managers of this LLC so they could operate it. Now for taxes, it was actually really simple. Any income and expense would report on our clients' tax returns, at least here in the United States. And that meant that they could choose to open up a personal bank account. We got our clients in touch with a bank that we work with so they could get their account open up. That gives them some place for their rental income to go. Now, as soon as the LLC was incorporated, we applied to the IRS for their, their own business's unique tax identification numbers. Diane said we call those EINs. Sometimes they're called tax ID numbers and so on. We need that at tax time, um, but it doesn't take long. Once we've got it incorporated, we can get it you know, instantly from the IRS once we know that our incorporation's gone through. Now, while the incorporation process was taking place, in this case we're using Georgia, who take about a week to get something done. So while that was going on, we also got our clients busy getting copies of their passports apostilled. Apostilling, for those of you that don't know, it's kind of like a super notarization where you're using a government office in the place of a notary public, and that government office swears that the passport copy you've produced is a true copy of a real passport. Now, our clients needed that to make their U.S. ITIN applications. And because I know from experience it takes a little bit of time to get that done in Australia, we wanted them to get a jump on it while we were doing everything else. Now, when the Apostille passport copies were completed, we also got our clients to complete their ITIN applications. And those are pretty simple. They're just one-page forms. Because we now, here's a cool thing, because we now have our LLC formed, our clients get to jump to the head of the line for getting an ITIN. But it's still going to take a few months, but they don't have to wait that year. We got a, it's a, you get a shortcut with the LLC. And so finally, when we get their ITIN applications back from them, our clients have everything they need to get their business account open. Because they're married, because they've got that LLC that they're holding jointly and they're filing a tax return for it together, and because it's a personal one, they didn't, they never actually elected to open up a business LLC account. They didn't need to in that case. They have the option but they didn't need to, and sometimes it can just be easier to run with that personal option. 
Now, on the other hand, if this had been an LLC that was owned by multiple people, more than just a husband and wife, we, we would have suggested that they create that business bank account just to keep things clean. But they do get a little bit of a break in this case because they were a married couple. And so it, it just it was easy. It was just step, step, step for these guys. Cool. Um, now we've talked about, I'm going to go back to taxes, okay, and we've talked about that mandatory 30% withholding. But this is such an important point, I just want to go over it one more time. If you buy your property, you aren't already in the system and don't do anything about your taxes, you're going to pay 30% in taxes and not be able to take any deductions. If you're in the system or you go ahead and get your I-10 but don't file your tax return, this is another little issue. Let's say you say, okay, I've set it up fine, but I'm not going to fi finalize it. I'm not going to file my tax return. Your bank account and your property can be seized by the IRS, and they can get real aggressive at doing that. So another issue, if you wait to get your I-10 until you file your first tax return, you have to pay that 30% up until the time your I-10 is issued. Now, as I mentioned, you may be able to petition the IRS to get some of it back, but there's no guarantees, and the process is going to cost you both time and money. The best, fastest, easiest way to get an I-10 is to form that business structure. Now, depending on the country in which you live, the state in which you invest, remember like Megan said, you're going to form an LLC, an LP, a series LLC, or an LLLP. Any of those work to get you on that fast track to getting an I-10. But like Megan said, it can take you one to two months to get the I-10. So we recommend that you get your structures in place before you close on your property. Because the last thing you want to do is start collecting rent and not have your I-10 so that you lose that 30%, and then you end up having to fight the IRS for the extra tax. Okay. There's another tax I want to talk about, a 10% withholding. Now, this tax is a, it's a mandatory 10% withholding under the U.S. Foreign Investment and Real Estate Property Tax. Don't worry about remembering the name of that act. Now, this occurs when you sell a property, and it's another one of those issues that occurs only for foreign investors. Now, there's a way around it, too, but please pay special attention to what I'm about to tell you because you need to take action on this plenty of time before you sell. You can request that the 10% does not apply to you by filing a Form 8288B, B as in boy, Form 8288B with the IRS at least 90 days prior to the sale of your property. Now, you're making a petition. It doesn't guarantee that they won't take that 10% uh, withholding. But if you've been clean all along, the chances are good. Um, the IRS then makes a determination, and if you're exempt, there you don't have to do that extra 10%. So another one of those little foreign investor things that you need to be aware of. By the way, don't worry. If you can't remember the name of that form, get in contact with us, and we can help walk you through that process. Now, the, the other thing that can be a challenge for foreign investors, and probably this is the one thing we get, one of, I think it's one of the things we get the most questions asked about, how do I open a bank account? Now, that's because you want to have access to the money you're making, and that means you need a bank. Generally speaking, property managers are reluctant to send money overseas, and that means you have to have a U.S. bank. Now, since 2001, opening a bank account in the U.S. has become tricky for foreigners. Most banks require that you come in person to their bank and they, they show some kind of an ID, such as your passport. You may actually have to furnish an ITIN at the same time. Now, if you open a bank account in the name of your business, you definitely need to furnish an ITIN. But you might have heard, noticed what I said there. Most banks are going to require that you come in person, so that means you're going to fly to the U.S. And for some people, that can be really difficult. Now, we do have a relationship with a bank for our clients. We can't guarantee that you're going to get a bank account open over the phone. That final decision has to rest with the bank. However, we absolutely will make an introduction for our clients and provide the paperwork you need. And for anyone who wants to make that connection, we'll make that introduction and, as I said, give you the paperwork you need. Wow. Okay. We've covered a lot here today. Uh, Megan, how do we pull all this information together? Maybe you can just walk a little through our process. Sure. I know it sounds daunting. I know everything that we've described is probably thinking, oh, God, do I really want to invest in the U.S.? Or, or, you know, finding a property, that's the easy part from what you guys are talking about. And it is true that you do have a lot of things to think about. But that's also, honestly, that's the job in many cases for your advisors. And that's why you're looking for somebody that you can trust, who can answer your questions, who understands the whole process, and can ask you questions that you don't even know that you needed to ask. 
we've got there's a lot of service providers out there. Um, you Google foreign investor and a gazillion things are going to pop up. But personally, I don't think that they're all created equal. What I think, you know, what you want, you want somebody who doesn't tell you when you ask them a question, oh, go check with your accountant or go ask your lawyer. You want to get an answer. And that's part of why Diane and I got together to put this comprehensive, this type of a comprehensive service package together for you. Between us, we've got a lot of years of experience, so we can back up what we say. And our goal is working with people like Matt and like Matt's group, integrating a service that you, so that you can invest here safely and you've got confidence that somebody is watching out for you. That's, that's a part of what we do, and that's why I think that we've got a strategic process that's worth looking at. You know, I, I think just to add on to what Megan just said, too, we do have a process. When you go to our website, in a second I'll give you the website so you can get that free ebook I talked about on the tax and legal issues. Um, but when you go there and you click to, hey, send me the form, you're going to see we ask you questions. In fact, I love it when we ask you more questions than you asked us because we're leading you through the process by asking you about you and what you're investing in, where you're investing, and what country you're from, and what your citizenship is, and if you have other people. We're helping form, you, form that plan for you. Now, part of this overall plan is filing the tax return. Now, the business tax return for an LP, LLP, LLC, or series LLC, there's a lot of initials there. Um, they're going to look the same whether your owners are foreign or domestic. That one is due on April 15th of the year following the year in question. You can extend that due date to September 15th by filing an extension. Now, those tax returns have a schedule with them that's called a Schedule K-1. That Schedule K-1 is prepared for each partner, and it shows the amount of income or loss that the partner needs to show on his or her personal return. What you see here is a Form 1040-NR. This is the personal tax return for non-residents, non-citizens. So in some cases, uh, a married couple can file just one Form 1040-NR, but most of the time, a married couple is going to have to each individually complete this form. This form is the one that's due by June 15th, but can be extended to October 15th. Now, you have to make sure you do the proper request for extending that ahead of the due date, just like you need to request ahead of time if you want to extend your business tax return. Um, I've just thrown a lot of dates at you, a lot of forms I know. Again, that's where you rely on your experts for knowing what the right forms and when you file those are. Now, there's also going to be some annual requirements for your business structure itself. Yep, and that's where I come back in. Um, in addition to your tax returns, there's three entity-related things that you need to take a look at each year. You've got to renew your resident agent service, you've got to file your annual reports, and you've got to prepare your annual minutes. And actually, I've got property taxes on this form, which is also important that we'll need to worry about. Going through those, the resident agent is sometimes called a registered office, um, resident agent, registered agent, registered office, there's a lot of different terms. Basically what they are is the legal agent in a state for a company. It's an official legal address placed on the public record and it's where legal documents are served. Now in a lot of states it's also going to be the address where government offices want to automatically send out regular correspondence, renewal notices, tax bills and so on. Now under US law you must have a resident state or a resident agent in every state where your business structure is either registered or is qualified to do business. That agent needs to provide a street address and they've got to be open during regular business hours so documents can be served. It's an annual service. You can expect to renew it every year too. Annual reports are, are the second part. Um, they're not always required for everything. Corporations almost always have to file it, but the entities that we're talking about, LLCs, LPs, and the derivatives don't. Now, most of the times, they're going to be filed with the same place where you registered your company. In other states, like Texas, they're not. They do theirs a little bit differently. And again, don't worry about that. This is a part of the service that we provide. So it's not something that you have to be frantically, oh, God, what do I do next, and when do I do it? Now, it is important to make sure that your annual reports are filed on time, though because most states assess the same penalties to annual reports that they do to maintain or to not maintaining a registered office. You have to maintain these two things to stay legal in the state. If you don't do that, what will happen oftentimes is your company will actually be dissolved. 
which can cost you, it usually winds up costing you in terms of extra fees and penalties to get yourself reinstated and back into good standing. Now the next one up is actually annual reports and it's not on this list, but annual reports are a written record that are prepared from an annual meeting. For large companies and public companies, this can involve actually holding a big meeting. But small companies, privately held companies, you, you can usually just prepare minutes and get everybody sign it off instead of actually going through the, the effort and having a meeting. As long as everybody signs it, you're fine. Now minutes aren't required by law, but we really recommend them because they are providing the written documentation of business decisions and confirm that everybody agreed to those decisions. They tell the IRS what your company intended to do and why. And what we see now is during an audit or during litigation, we see minute books demanded all the time. You can guarantee. So the more complete your minute book is, the better off you are when you're trying to defend against audits or lawsuits or even if it's an intercompany fight and you and your partners get into a dispute about who said what and when and what direction you were going in. Um, and just quickly, because I, I have got property taxes here and mentioned it, property taxes, that's separate from your income tax, okay? This is something that, that's charged by the state or actually usually by the county where the state is, and it's completely separate, it runs on a separate schedule, but it's something to also factor into your, your yearly maintenance because it is something that has to be taken care of. Yeah, I think, Megan, most of the time that the property taxes get handled by your property manager. But it's important to realize the distinction on the taxes. In fact, that's something we go into in the ebook is all the different kinds of taxes you need to watch out for. And I don't mean to scare you that there's a lot of taxes here. Um, in fact, if you've done it right, you're going to pay very little income tax. It's one of the beauties of real estate in the U.S. Okay, let's talk about what it get, takes to get started. Um, go to, you see it there on your screen, LegalShelfCompany.com. You can do LegalShelfCompany.com slash international, or if you use the address on the screen, LegalShelfCompany.com, you're going to see a little slide that comes up and says, do you want to go to the U.S. side or the international side? Select the international side. And there you're going to see instructions on how to get the free download ebook, Buying U.S. Real Estate, What, real, what Foreign Investors Need to Know. You see a copy of it there. This book is going to go into the top topics we've talked about here in more depth and also going to show you some more strategies. You're also going to read more about how we use our process and how we help foreign investors with their business structures and tax issues. So the website, again, is LegalShelfCompany.com. And with that, I'm turning it back over to Matt. Thank you all for the, your time today. Fantastic. Well, let me just check in with folks uh, here and uh, uh, poll you guys and see uh, how many people felt that that was uh, a very substantive 60 minutes of content. Click that hand icon uh, and let us know if you felt that that was a good use of an hour of your time tonight if you got a lot of substance out of that webinar. Okay, and uh, put your hands down. And now let me ask, uh, how many people are a little bit overwhelmed uh, with the amount of information that you just received and it was uh, a lot of information uh, uh, to digest at one time? How many people are feeling a little bit overwhelmed with that amount of content? Okay, great. So, um, you know, two things. Number one is that we're recording this webinar, and so we're going to send that out to you and you can watch through the webinar again. And then number two, of course, you can get the free ebook, which uh, goes through all this content and goes through in a lot of more detail. And that's in a format where you can really sit down and underline stuff and think through stuff and so forth. Uh, but of course, the most, um, the most important thing is for you to be able to contact Megan and Diane, and you see their emails here, um, you know, to uh, make sure that you do this right for you and that you get your personal situation uh, taken care of. So with that, what I want to do is I want to open it up for um, questions. And I want to ask the first one um, to Diane while you guys are typing your questions in the box. And Diane, one of the things we promised uh, to uh, disclose on this webinar is what tax change in 2013 is going to affect uh, foreign nationals buying U.S. real estate. Oh, that's interesting. You know, it's interesting because I was just thinking, oh, one of the things I forgot to mention is a special tax advantage that foreign investors get this next year. Now, it's interesting because there's a new surtax coming this next year, but it only applies to U.S. investors. Real estate investors do not have to pay that extra 3.8% surtax. 
So I think that's fascinating that there's a special um, kind of tax break available. But otherwise, based on where we have the law right now, probably the biggest change that's coming is in what we call capital gains tax rate. And what that means is when you hold a property for over a year and you sell it and you have gains on that, currently the most tax you'll pay is 15% federal. There could additionally be state depending on the state you're in. That's going to increase to 20% federal and then again whatever you have for the state. Now right now there's a lot of confusion with the US tax and so we're not sure if the law might change but where it is right now is the maximum right now is a 15% plus state and it will be moving to 20% plus state. But if you hear about this new surtax starting January 1st, guess what? Foreign investors don't have to pay it. So that's cool. Awesome. Thanks for that, Diane. All right. So we have uh, a lot of questions coming in. And by the way, I, I was not sure how many people would show up to this webinar because it's a very niche um, webinar. You know, it's not certainly for our entire uh, base, but we got we got like a couple hundred people that actually registered for this webinar, and we are getting some really substantive questions pouring in. So I want to try to fire these off. Some of them will have short answers, and we can just answer them short, uh, and, and, and some of them will have a little bit longer answers. And then um, if we don't get to all of the questions, I'm going to email every single question uh, and the email of the person who asked it to Megan and Diane to make sure that you get it answered. But I want to jump into these here um, and see if we can uh, uh, rifle through a few of these. Okay, so the first question is, is the Series LLC available in Arizona? Is that one of the states that it's available in? Um, series LLC, Arizona doesn't have its own Series LLC law, but it does accept um, LLCs that are created in a Series state. And those, there, there are nine states. Um, Texas is one, Nevada is one, Delaware, those are the three big ones, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Iowa, Kansas, Illinois, and there might be one or two others. So those are the big states. But we can still take that LLC and register it to do business in Arizona. So yeah, you're fine. Great. Okay, uh, another question. I was, under the, I was under the opinion that a series LLC is too new and thus we don't know if particular states will decide to pierce the LLC. You know, the original LLC law was brought into place, I think, almost 15 years ago. And it's really interesting to watch it grow. Um, maybe five years ago, six years ago, I would have agreed with that statement. Um, but in today's law, I think it's OK. I, I'm not seeing a problem. I have seen litigation come up. I haven't seen it busted. I have seen that asset protection and that separation of assets upheld. Um, in multiple states that don't have their own series LLC law on the books. Um, and I'm also seeing a lot of very learned, uh, very respected legal commentators and legal paper writers that are really starting to dive into this and look at it. So I think, I really do think that it is okay, but it is a personal decision for everybody. Great. I'm Next. More point on this. Yeah, I'm going to add one more point on that too. One of the questions that was uh, that people had is, we're not sure how the IRS is going to treat this, and so that also created some concern. But the IRS did come out with a position on this, gosh, about four or five years ago, and that's when we really started seeing this the swing into vogue. And they are commonly used by people who, especially people who have real estate. Okay, next question: Can a Canadian write off depreciation on a second home? Um, okay, a Canadian. I don't know that the Canadian would matter, but if you have a property that is not an investment property in the U.S., no matter what country you're from, um, if it's not being used in what we call a trade or business, then it cannot be depreciated. Um, there are specific rules, though, like maybe you stay there part of the time and then you rent it out to someone else, and if that's the case, then you can take the depreciation. Okay. Uh, there is a question here about uh, the, is there state withholding on top of federal withholding? Um, well, you know, that, that's an interesting question. I'm guessing that they're talking about that on the, the rental streams. And the answer is going to be no, unless you have opted out of the system and you're not filing your returns, in which case the states, depending on which state, can get really aggressive. I mean, California is really quick to go in and sweep your bank account. Um, we, we just recommend getting into the system and doing that right. Um, the one difference in this that just to talk about is if you sell a property in California and you're a non-California resident, they are going to do a mandatory withholding until you file your tax return. And at that time, you can get some or all of that money back. But that's just true for anybody. If you live in another state other than California, they're doing that too. 
Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, can you please address estate taxes? I understand the U.S. only gives a small exemption to foreigners, so if you get hit by a bus and have 500000 in equity in U.S. properties, your spouse uh, would, uh, would have a huge portion of their assets kept by the U.S. government. Is that, is that correct, and can you address that? That will depend on where you're from um, and what the state of the tax treaty is. Um, I, think the, 60, I, think 000, the, I think the person who asked the question was from Australia. Okay. Um, you know what? I'd have to look at Australia for sure, but I think that there is a tax treaty in place for Australia that actually lets you, depending on the, the size of your estate, it actually lets you register the whole thing under U.S., like report the entire value of your worldwide estate under U.S. law, but that also then gives you the ability to take the entire U.S. exemption amount, which right now I think is like $5 million a person. Yeah, so, but it changes December 31st. But it's <laughs> going to change. It's going to probably come down some. We're not sure. Um, so the answer on that one is that one is really an individual question that we kind of have to tackle one at a time, one country at a time, one person at a time. Great. And and, you heard okay. a hesitation. It might have heard my laugh because Megan and I really had a long discussion on whether we wanted to cover estate tax in this, and we said, nope, we're not going to do it because it's going to be a seminar all to itself. And, um, and the U.S. tax law is in such flux that the reality is we can't predict what it's going to be unless you can tell us exactly when you're going to die, in which case we'll have a better chance there. <laughs> Great. So, so for more information and for people that want to have serious estate planning discussions about your individual situation, um, you can definitely contact Megan and Diane and yeah. talk to them about that in the context of your, your larger asset protection strategy here with U.S. real estate. Um, another question, do you recommend setting up a single member LLC if I would like to invest on my own? Depends on where you're from. Um, if you're from Canada, absolutely not. Um, if you're from another country, oftentimes all that a single member LLC means, for, for legal it just means that the LLC has one owner. And from a tax perspective, it means that for taxes, it's not going to file a separate partnership return. It's, it's actually going to report on your personal return. Um, and generally, you know, generally speaking, I don't see a problem with it at all, um, again, as long as you're not in Canada. Um, and this, and actually, it can be a great way because it lets you get that ITIN number. So that might be, depending on the state you're in or country you're from, it might be a good idea. Great a question about the bank accounts. Um, are you helping to set up a personal or a business bank account for them? Uh, just to clarify, we all we do is make the introduction. But um, the answer is they, it can be for. A, a, Either one. Um, we, for the business, you know, we provide that we can help you with that paperwork that you need for the business. Uh, uh, there's certain information you need from the business structure itself to take to the bank, and we can help you with that. And then it, it's it's up to individual cases on whether the bank is going to open the bank account or not, without you going there. Okay. Uh, the next question: How does all this apply with the EB-5 investor program from U.S. Immigration? I don't That's have a, a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? We'll weird. table that one and come back with it with an answer on that one. We'll shoot that out to Matt, and he can kind of shoot that out to everybody. So EB5 investor. Okay, okay great. Um, is there any is there any uh, set amount for foreign investors to invest? Uh, I presume that maybe. Maybe that relates to the EB five question or something like that. If you're just buying, if you're just buying real estate, you can buy real estate for any any price that you want, um, and then uh, you can hold that um, in the entity that's right for you. Um, the next question is: If I have a Nevada LLC right now, can it be converted into a series LLC? It sure can. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, I'm going to try to read this one. It looks like a, the question says, I have three rental properties at the moment in Atlanta, Georgia. I live in Bolivia and I declare taxes, but I am not organized as any type of legal structure. Can I continue going this way? Um, okay, if I if I'm heard that correctly, they're currently filing taxes, is that correct, in the U.S.? That's what I. That's how I read it. 
Yeah, and so I'm guessing that they must already have a social security number from before or an ITIN number already, in which case they're fine. Um, the, the, well, I, I shouldn't say fine. Um, the, the question then becomes asset protection. Uh, for today, though, getting into the U.S. system is much harder than it used to be. And so if you don't already have a social security number, you, you absolutely are going to need to get a business structure first because that's about the only way to get into the ITIN without paying that 30%. Otherwise, I think you need to look at asset protection as your reason to have a business structure. Great. So we've got a bunch of questions on pricing, um, and I know that you guys cover your full suite of pricing for your different services in the ebook. So people are asking about annual filing fees, and they're asking about other types of things. Do you want to speak to that at all now, or do you just want them to to read it in the ebook? Um, I think the best thing might be to just uh, please go over to our website at LegalShelfCompany.com, uh, click on the international, and you'll see where you can get the ebook. Take a look at that because you'll see uh, how it, how our prices are, and additionally, what the next step is to work with us. Yeah. Okay. And, and states vary wi wildly. Um, you know, California and Massachusetts are. are hundreds of dollars to renew every year, whereas Delaware and Nevada, Florida are, are considerably less. So it really will depend on where you're going and, and what we're doing. Great. Okay, does a citizen of Belize have any uh, specific red flags in regards to tax consequences for U.S. real estate investing in terms of their tax treaty with the United States? I'm not, not that aware, I'm aware of. of. No, I'm not aware of that either. Okay. No, I, I think the biggest issues come, again, from, from the close parties, from, from NAFTA, from the NAFTA-related stuff, Mexico and Canada. Those are the ones that really, really have an impact, and that is just because we share the border and so much commerce back and forth. Okay. For a single-member LLC, do I have to prepare annual reports? Um, it will depend on the state. Not every state requires you to file an annual report for an LLC. Um, but, you know, will you have some type of an annual filing, i.e. your tax return? Sure. Okay. Uh, is there any path to U.S. citizenship for foreign nationals for investing a certain amount, say a million dollars or more, in U.S. property? I heard that something like that was in the works. I think that that's more of a question for immigration, uh, an immigration attorney, um, and I don't, I, I for certainly am not, don't feel qualified to answer that question. Okay. But we can refer to an immigration attorney. Okay, great. Um, next question. I have been a sole proprietor of my own company since 1994. I will be renewing my... Uh, CA real estate broker's license again in 2014. Um, I don't know if that means California. California, maybe? Well, or either Canada. Or Canada. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, CA real estate license, broker's license in 2014, and we'll decide if I want to do another sole proprietor or possibly LLC in Nevada, the types of structure you mentioned tonight. Will you go into greater detail on these structures in the e-book? Yes, we do. There's a lot more information on in the e-book. Okay. Um, all right. I am a California resident. Can I form an LLC in another state? I think they mean Nevada, and then own real estate in California if they're a California resident. And does that provide them any benefit? No. From a tax point of view, it's not going to help you. No. I mean, can you? Yes. Should you? I doubt it. Uh, the, the bottom line is, is that you'll pay the same amount of California fees, plus you've got to pay a Nevada fee for doing it that way. Okay. Uh, my investor just bought one property in the U.S. Would it be advantageous for him to get an ITIN number as well? Right away, yes. <laughs> do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. <laughs> go immediately and get an ITIN. Going to the IRS well, real yeah, quick here. That's just it. Every month you're going to knock thirty percent off of what you earn every month until you have an ITIN, and even after that, you still got to wait till your tax return gets filed and dealt with. I mean. I think that's the beauty of, of creating a business structure. If nothing else, that gives you a shortcut to immediately apply for your IPIN. Otherwise, you know, you could wait for you could wait eleven and a half months or more. Right. Okay, great. 
Um, are you guys uh, are you guys cool with just a couple more uh, questions here? Uh, a couple final questions here. If anybody's got final questions, go ahead and uh, and type them in. You guys cool for a couple more minutes? I've got oh, just yeah, a couple yeah. minutes. Yeah. Two 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 to three minutes more. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, just go ahead and type your final questions in there, folks. I want to make sure that I get to the ones who have not asked any questions yet. All right, and let's see. Somebody is asking about specific. Let me read this one. They have some specific question here. Um, an Arizona firm has tried charging my friend for various filings that you have not mentioned. A BE605, a BE-15, uh, verifying W8s annually, 1042S, 1096. Are these uh, bogus charges, i.e., should uh, that they're charging him for? That's interesting. Okay, the BE15 are oh, um, that's, that's the Board of Equalization one. Yeah. I don't think that that applies if you've got real estate under. I can't remember what it was, but it was a big number. Yeah, um, th that has yeah that has to do with the file. Gosh, it was in the millions. Mm -hmm. You had to have a, a lot of real estate to have to file that. Uh, a 1096 I heard was one of the others. That's you're filing that if you're paying independent contractors. Mm -hmm. So I, I suspect if they had a lot of real estate, that might be okay. But for the average guy, that's not going to be applicable. Okay, fantastic. So let me just see if we have uh, one last question here that I can uh, pull up. I just want to, man, there's a lot of substantive uh, questions coming in here. So great uh, discussion tonight, everybody. Let me see if I can pull one last question here. Uh, all right, I'm going to take the last question, and then anybody else, um, go ahead and type your questions in right now. This is the last question I'm going to ask, so you're not going to get it answered tonight, but I'm going to email it to Megan and Diane along with your email so they can send you a response to anything that did not get answered. But the last question for tonight is this, uh, and it's for Megan. It says, Megan, being by being a paralegal, um, uh, let's see. No, that's not, I don't understand that question, sorry. I'm going to send that question to Megan, I don't understand it. I'm going to ask a different one. Um, the question is, I'm a Canadian citizen and I own a property in Florida. Now that I've completed the renovations, I will start renting it in January of 2013. Should I ask for an ITIN right away or should I wait for 2013? Um, okay, so you haven't had any income on the property yet. Um, so I don't think that you can apply for an ITIN yet. Um, well, they can apply for the ITIN with the business structure. Yeah, if they put a business structure together to hold it. Otherwise, they yeah. can't. Yeah, they can't do it until they file the return. And mm -hmm. if it's a zero, I mean, I suppose you could file a zero return and do that. But I'm not sure that they would accept it. They might kick out. You might have another 12 months to wait. What, I think that's maybe a person who needs to talk to us. Yeah, I think I think a lot of these questions are, are there, there's a lot of individual circumstance mm -hmm. questions and yeah. things like that. So so we're, we're going to leave it there in terms of the questions. I'm going to forward all of the questions to Dan and Megan, and they'll be able to respond to anybody that didn't get an answer uh, on the call tonight. But go ahead uh, to Legal Shelf Company, and you can download uh, this full report for free. It goes into this in a lot more detail. We're also recording this webinar. So if you registered for the webinar, you will get uh, a recording of everything we discussed tonight. You can listen to that again. And then, of course, uh, schedule your individualized consultations uh, so Megan and Dan can advise you personally uh, on your individual situation. So with that, uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining and participating tonight. Your questions always make uh, these things great. And, of course, Megan and Dan, thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your evening to do this event for us tonight. It was really uh, substantive and really great. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Good night.